Mike Tyson is one of the greatest athletes in world history, the youngest heavyweight boxing champion of all time. He is also a best-selling author, Broadway star, businessman, movie actor, and founder of the charity organization, the Mike Tyson Cares Foundation. He has been on top of the world and has also experienced hitting rock bottom. I had a chance to sit down with Mike in Florida for a conversation about his difficult childhood and his incredible mentors, career, and family. Along the way, he shared some extraordinary life lessons and wisdom. Hi everybody, this is Solomon with History Bites. I'm really excited to be here today with Mike Tyson, who is one of the greatest athletes of all time. Slow mo, brother! Huh? Okay. <laughs> 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 and, and one of the most humble guys of all time. It, it's true. At the age of 20, he became the youngest heavyweight boxing champion in the world, and he became known as Iron Mike because of his extreme toughness and because of his ability to dominate his opponents in the ring. Uh, Mike, you really wanted me to call you Mike. Yeah, I appreciate that. So, so Mike, thanks so much for coming on the History Bites YouTube channel. Hey, History Bites. Hey, I bite the History Bites. <laughs> I appreciate it. So, Mike bites. You ever seen Mike bites? I have. Yeah, the little ear shaped with piece the, of the band of the ear. Yeah. You work together with him now, right? We're partners. Yes. See, he didn't think he thought this was kind of making fun of him, but then he saw the <laughs> check and how this stuff is working. Hey, this is not bad. It's not bad. We're the only two fighters that still getting paid from one fight for twenty years ago, thirty right. years ago. And, and obviously his ear still has the part missing out of it. I believe so, yeah. Stuff happens, you know how that goes. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Well. <laughs> he was, he was headbutting you. Well, I headbutt him a couple of times as well. I just, I don't know, I get carried away sometimes, you know. We all do. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so with, in keeping with history, we talk about the history of your life story. At the very beginning, when and where were you born? I was born in Cumberland Hospitals in Fort Greene, and I was born in 1966. I lived in Bedford Stuyvesant, and I can remember having a decent life for a short period of my life, having a nice brownstone looking good for a minute. Then one year, the people came and they took all of our furniture and, and decorated the concrete with it and stuff. You got to go stay out there with your furniture for no one steals anything. and. I don't know what happened. We eventually got a, a moving truck that took us to Brownsville. Now I live in Brownsville, you know. Once you're in Brownsville, babe, you've got to forget it. You, you, that's the lowest you can go in New York City. So you yeah. can't go no lower than that. No lower than Brownsville. And everything is um, survival of the fittest. You got the um, muggings, robberies, murders. It's just happening there. You wind up living in the building with the murderers and stuff. They become your friends, they become your neighbors, the drug dealers, the killers, the hustlers, the guys with the car, the guys with the girl, the guys with the clothes. And they become your role model because you have nowhere else to go. You can't in the Italian neighborhood, you get killed, you go up to town. Your black guy's not gonna survive. No black kid's gonna survive in New York in the 70s like that in different neighborhoods. So um, I was, um, I remember everybody stayed in their neighborhood, kind of stuff. Black and Puerto Ricans lived in the same neighborhood, but um, mostly people had their own, the whites had their own neighborhood, and you know not to go there. Go in because you know there's going to be problems if you go there. That was just we all knew our place where to go and where not to go. And then some of us would venture out to Manhattan and find scores and robberies. Because you know you live in the same Brooklyn, it was too close. Everybody knows everybody now. Okay. Everybody knows who does what. So recognized you. Even if you don't know them personally, like you know who they are, you know what he's, what crew he's in, you know what they do. So everybody was just predators out there. That was just my life, being a predator, preying on people. It's just that's all I knew, hustling. That's what I thought I was gonna do. I thought I was gonna be a, a criminal in my life. I thought I was gonna be a tough guy, gangster. You know, I spent the rest of my life in jail, come out, but that didn't happen. Most of my friends, my closest friends, family members, that happened to them. But I was on, um, I was on, uh, I was on the way of being a really dark guy, you know, in prison and all that stuff for my life. But um, I found, I ran into Bobby Stewart, and he introduced me to Customato. And um, my life has been different ever since. You know, I had hard times, but listen. Um, just being around Customato, 
you realize that um, if you succeed once, you got the charisma, the charisma, you got the guts to do it again. You know, this is not no one horse ro rodeo. You can do it as long as you want if you believe. Do you remember being bullied as a kid? Oh man, bullied. I can remember somebody taking my glasses like yours, open up like a, a milk cart and put the, in the gas tank. And I was running. I was running, one guy, my hat and my glass, something. He was coming to get it because I had Somebody hit me, smacked me in the face, and it came off, and I kept running. And the guy was running, hey, and I ran when he came to give me my glasses. I just ran. He said, hey, 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 no, no, no. Your glasses, you dropped them yesterday when you were running. He, he, this guy had my glasses and gave it to me. And when I saw him, I started running, because I'm used to people picking them. I just run. I don't look at their face. Somebody come close to me, I start running. And, um, yeah, I was really bullied bad. Yeah, I was one of those guys. That's why I'm who I am now. And they called you names? The names, that's, hey, that's the beginning stage. You know, that's not deep yet. The names are not deep yet until they start putting physical damage on you. Then that's when the names start to hurt it just as much as the punches. When he knows he could do anything to you and you're not, there's not going to be no incoming coming back. You're scared to death to fight this guy. Next thing you know, he gets his friends to watch him kick your butt. Then his friends start jumping in and kicking your butt, yeah. So when did you fight back? When was your first fight? Well, over a pigeon. Over a pigeon. This guy came to steal my bird, and he had one of my birds. He, and I'm like, please, please give me my bird, please. And he fat, such and such, and all these explicit names. And there was a guy, when he took the bird, he broke his head up and he hit me with the bird's body, the blow was on me. And there was a guy that was with him. They came to bully me, too. And he said, you better fight him. He was so mad that this guy did this to me. He was with the guy. And he, he walked around and said, you better fight him, you better fight him now. And I fought. I got real scared then when that guy, he's on his side and he's telling me to fight the guy and he has emotions about it. And I thought, I fought him. You know, and I used to always have this guy named Wise. He was a hustler guy. And I used to always smoke weed with him. I was, I was like 11, we used to smoke weed, but he's like 18. And so I was watching him be an amateur boxer. He used to always be shadow boxing. And I always watched him. I always watched him box. I never fought though, but I always watched him. And I had that fight. I did stuff that he was teaching me. I never practiced with him, I was watching him. And I did what he was watching, I skipped left and I dropped the guy, and everybody started applauding me. And it was a rap, then I'm fighting every day now. Why'd you care so much about pigeons? I don't know, that's my first love, affection to animals. It could have been a dog, but they just hit me, they were there first. Because they're all over the place in the city, right? Yeah, they all come from that pigeon in the city. You see that pigeon, all the beautiful, that two million dollar pigeon, all come from there. That's where it starts, from right there, rock pigeon. Now see how they can make, they can take this little bird that we're trying to kill, we're ordering hawks, we're putting pesticide and then try to kill these birds. But they wind up coming from that, they wind up costing you two million dollars. To have them. It's not weird. We kill them. We can't kill enough of these pigeons. And from these pigeons, we find the most expensive one of all. You were arrested 38 times by the time you were 13, maybe? Probably more, even. And then you mentioned that guy earlier, Bobby Stewart, that you met while you were at the Tryon School for Boys. School for Boys. So who was Bobby Stewart? Bobby Stewart was a former um, light heavyweight amateur champion. He beat Michael Dokes, who's a heavyweight champion and professional. He beat him when he was an amateur. And Cuss and him was good friends during his boxing career. I met him for being locked up. I did some really, he was in a really bad, that's all the tough guy, the boxers, the bouncers. They all worked at that one place, this one cottage, because it was really bad. That's all the murderers and all those guys. And I had this something, I got kicked, got in a big, bad fight, and I got transferred to that cottage. That's where you can't go out. You got to be escorted everywhere you go. And that was the bad cottage. And that's where I, I met Mr. Stewart. And you boxed with him. Well, it didn't happen. I had to, 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 to even be able to box with him, you have to be on your, 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 uh, your schedule. You have to be on a certain level. So it was a reward. Yeah, it's a reward to get knocked out. What do you mean? You think you just go, go in here and get knocked out? No, you got to do, do good in school. <laughs> you got to do good at the... Um, Conversating with the rest of the staff remember you gotta clean through your chores to get knocked out. You can't just go in, go in there and get knocked out and no one knows who you are. They gotta, <laughs> you gotta do all your chores and all that stuff, do good in school, then you can get knocked out. So it was a pleasure, it was a privilege to get knocked out. No, really. 
It was a privilege. I know people are looking and saying, this is crazy. It was a privilege to get knocked out back then. I don't know why. Because when I first came there, I saw kids coming at pizza out, their ribs were bruised, but they were happy. And how did, how did Mr. Cuss find out about you? From Mr. Stewart. So he came to watch you? Said, yeah, we have a 13-year-old 13, 13 kid. He's 200 pounds. He's solid as a rock. I want you to spot him. I want you to see him. His name is Mike Tyson. And it was a rap ever since then. And I, I remember reading that when Mr. Cuss saw you, he took Bobby Stewart aside and he said, uh, that's the heavyweight champion of the world. But he didn't know how old he said he'd lie. He can't be 13. The guy said, no way he can be 13. No way. He, don't want, he just don't want to go to prison with the older men. There's no way he's 13. After he saw me box too, he said, holy moly. He said, that's the, he said besides distraction, that's the next heavyweight champ of the world right here. Yeah, I, had, I had never had nobody um, put that much interest in me, care that much about me. You know, he wanted to know everything. Who I talked today? What you do today? How was today? Who did you meet today? What's their name today? He just wanted to know everything about what made me tick. Well, yeah, everything. And for people who don't know, who is Customato? Customato is the world's greatest fight trainer and manager. He is my manager and trainer. He, um, 13 years old, he taught me how to fight. And he, um, I was, I'm the greatest fighting machine ever because he was my trainer. That's the only reason. Anybody else, I wouldn't be nothing. I'd be average. Because Mata made me greater than what I ever dreamed to be. So he had you come and live with them so that you could a year. train full time? Yes. So the goal was, we're going to make you the champion. I came at, listen, I came at 13, and at 20 I was champion. And he adopted you when you were about 14? 14, 15. So he really cared about you. You know, this is interesting. A lot of people don't think he did. They just thought he wanted, he didn't listen. They thought he wanted fame and money. He never took a penny from me. When I went broke, he had $200,000 waiting for me. Like he said, I knew you were going to waste everything, so I had this for you, you know? I ain't know what to do. I just, I'm just constantly humbling me. That's all he wants to do. That's all he wants to do is humble me every time I get big headed. You know, I'll put me in my place. But when I'm doing this to somebody else, he wants me to do it. But if I'm trying to be arrogant around him, it puts me in my place. He would make you mop the floor, right, of the well, gym? Listen, I don't mind that. I asked him, like, who do you think you are? That made me feel like I did something wrong when he said that to me. He would still tell you things, though, like, you're going to be the greatest, you're going to have big houses, you're going to be around the world, and people yeah, are going to love you. Yeah. yeah, he said that, too. But he said, I can see you're not going to listen to me, you're not going to learn. You know what I mean? You gotta get hurt to learn. You don't learn. You don't listen well, I can tell. He's right. What was his personality like? When everything's going well, I'm winning all the fights. It's beautiful. He, he can't get drunk enough. That's why every time I go to this, every time I go to this headstone, I always pour champagne because he loves champagne after every fight, every tournament, he always drank. I didn't drink really back then, but he uh, he always drank like to celebrate for the championship. He made everything small, real big. Anything, like if he's that eating pizza, oh, I've been all over the world, I ate pizzas all over the world. This is the greatest pizza in the world. He made everything exciting. You're talking about a cigarette butt. He makes it so glorious. A cigarette butt. He just, he has the... And you said he had intimidation down to a science. Yeah. So what would he do to intimidate you? He didn't have to say nothing. That was scary enough. You know, when he just didn't say nothing. If I did harbor in the gym, he wouldn't even talk. I was so miserable. I got something to kill that guy tomorrow. We box. You know. Always wanted to make him happy. I know by becoming champ will make him happy. That was the only thing he dreamed about was fighting. Heavyweight champ. That's all he dreamed about. That's all he dreamt about. All. That's all. That's all he dreamt about was fighters. So you once, you were, we were talking earlier and you called him, he was like a Roman emperor, a Roman general. Obviously, Customato, he was, he was Italian. Um, I have two younger siblings adopted from Ethiopia. Obviously, you're black and he was white. Did you ever think about that or was it just, he's my dad, he's my adopted dad? You know, um, 
This is interesting, because Cus has done this with other fighters. Like Floyd Patterson, he's done it. We got him at 13 years old from a bad boy. Made him two-time heavyweight champion. So um, it wasn't more that he was white and I was black. It was that he came from a crappy neighborhood. I came from a crappy neighborhood. He was Italian in the 20s, which is like being black in the 20s, you know, back then. And I used to always say, yeah, we had slaves, this and that. And he always used to tell me, well, at least they fed the slaves. They don't feed Italians, all right? He was always, a, he always had a chip on his shoulder about being Italian and stuff. You know, he was born in 1908, so you see, they seen a whole lot of bad stuff with those guys. And, um, you know, with mobsters in particular. And he, he didn't like the mob because he said the only, thing, the only people they heard was Italians. So he wasn't so big on that stuff. Which he's probably right. All they did was hurt Italian people. He didn't like that about the mob. What, what did he teach you about boxing? He taught me this. Be careful how you fight your fight. Because the way you fight your fight be the way you live your life. That's what he taught me about boxing. And as far as like the strategy of boxing goes, what did he teach you? Like he had that style I heard about called peekaboo yeah, but style. That's pretty dated, but it worked for me. And what was that peekaboo style? Hands up, moving your head, planted feet. Well, you know, one feet should be in front of the other one, but it's always side, like um, karate. He, he learned the peekaboo style he, from watching karate. And you would watch films of old fights, right? Any fight, anybody that's been filmed, I watched them. What was your routine like each day? Okay. First thing, three o'clock, we're running. Getting up running, you come back. We're doing a couple of hundred abs, push-ups, all that stuff. Get around 500 push-ups, 500 abs. And um, watch some more film and stuff. Get in the hot tub, your body's aching and stuff. And get ready to go to the gym. That's all we had to see. Well, I used to go to school, but then I, I quit school and I started fighting full time since I was like, yeah, 17 years old, full time boxing, full time, full time. I wasn't, um, I wasn't used to be. I wasn't a normal kid because I quit school to just box, you know, all my life. I quit school at like 17 to be a fighter. And I was so happy to get kicked out of school. Now, you got to hear this. I'm getting kicked out of school, right? I'm so happy because now I'm fine. Then Cuz comes back and get me back into school. I said, what the? I'm getting kicked out for this thing in Sparkling. He gets me coming in and he, boom, I'm back in school again. Oh, no. Man, so he, wa he wanted you to graduate. Uh-huh, that was, that was his pride and joy. And he was so disappointed when I wasn't agreeing with him. I said, this is nuts. I want to be champion. He said, no, but be champion. He said, this is, this is what Cuz said. I said, listen. The best fighters are the ones that can have best problem solvers. School is good for problem solving, and that helps you become a better fighter. So when you were a teenager, you were living at his house, right? Yeah. And what was that house like? Beautiful to me. From where I lived, I lived in a pig stack compared to this. And what well, this is, listen, this is so funny, right? Listen, my life now, right? I went and, um... The house is everything to me. That was my identity. It's beautiful. I always bring my friends to school to the house, show my house off, showing off. And um, that's why the moment is special. Like I look at that, I go by a drive, look at the house now. Ugh, uh, this is an ugly house now. Now all of a sudden I'm somebody. I've been in mansions, 40, 50 room mansions. Now I'm somebody. This house that created me made me the person I am. Ugh, now it's not cool no more. You know? And that's, us, and that's why I say, you enjoy that moment. That moment that this house meant everything to me. It's meant everything, this house, it meant everything. It was my identity, it meant everything to me. It was like a, it was a white Victorian house with 14 rooms and a gym? Yeah, no, it wasn't no gym. Well, we did, no, that's true. Right downstairs, there was a, a, a big bag we punched on the downstairs. The weather, because the weather gets so bad out there. Closed down the whole city, so we have to have a little gym downstairs. We hit the bag and work out. And then where, where else would you train? In the town, four miles out of town. Town of Catskill. So you, we were talking about how Mr. Cuss was a great boxing trainer. He knew Muhammad Ali. Why did he put you on the phone with Muhammad Ali? Wasn't it when you were like 14? Yeah, he said, Ali, listen, every time he talks to famous people, I'll be on the other phone listening. 
He talks to famous people. I'm listening on the phone, what he's talking about. He didn't know that. <laughs> and so he said, listen, Ali, um, no, Muhammad, I got this I got this black kid, young kid, he's gonna be heavyweight champion where he's 15 years old, 14, tell him to stay with me. He didn't know I heard it, tell him to stick with me. Cause he used to his father's making money, then they leave him. So he thought, I was, I was happy to have family. I was totally different than those other fighters. Even we didn't do good, we're family still, right? I never had a family before. So he thought, <clears throat> this is what really blew my He thought that I would leave him if they wouldn't give me a car or something. You know, he thought that somebody would offer me another car and I might leave him because that's been happening to him. This too. He had to get me a car. He thought I was going to go with somebody else if they offered me a car. And that's <laughs> what happened. I, this is my family. What about... I said, what do you mean? This is my family. Well, the guy go give me a car and I'm going to say, hey, bye, guys. The car. I didn't understand the concept. People do that. I didn't understand because I'm, I'm doing this from a family perspective. I'm happy. And he, I just couldn't get it. He thought that I was going to leave him. He thought for some reason I was, these people were offering me some money and I was going to leave him. Now that you loved him. Now, I, I, but listen, even being a young kid, you know how that affected me? That he thought I was going to leave him? Or did something I do give him the indication that I would leave him if things got hot. That's why I thought that maybe they're talking about me that I'm not tough enough, I might leave them, so they're trying to keep me in their contract. I didn't understand that. I said, I don't want no contract. You tell me what you want. Like, you know, I, didn't, I didn't understand business. I didn't understand business. That's why I got messed up a lot. I didn't understand. I said, we're partners, we're partners to the end. I never knew guys want to make it all and then leave me in the gutter. Hey, so we were talking about Mr. Cuss putting you on the phone with Muhammad Ali. When did you first see Muhammad Ali in person? I saw him in person, but I was far away when I was in Spafford. We saw the greatest, and he walked in and talked to us. Spafford, the juvenile detention center, yeah. And what was the greatest? The movie. They, he, um, it was the name of his movie, The Greatest. We watched the movie, then they turned the lights on, and he walked in. And what'd you think? First thing I said, I want to be like him. The crowd went crazy. I, I knew who he was, but I didn't know the, the depth. And that's I want to be like him. And right after that, I get transferred to this place with Bobby Stewart. Well, I got the way he works, and then I got kicked out of there and then went to the cottage he was in. I wanted to go there because once I heard it was a fight over there, I wanted to go there. I wanted to be around him. So you were training with Mr. Cuss for a number of years, and then you went to the Junior Olympics around 80, 81. 81. And you won. Is that when you started to gain notoriety as a boxer? Yes, because I would go to New York and people would say, hey man, you won the juniors, huh? I, was, I lost in that tournament too. And you would never know that people from your neighborhood would know who you are. I never knew that the hustler guys looked at sports. I never knew these guys. And so people started noticing, noticing me when I went to New York, Brooklyn. And then you won the Junior Olympics again in 82? Yes. yes, yes I did. And did Mr. Cuss, did he have a plan for when he wanted you to become a pro? Yeah, everything worked out. Listen, he, he wasn't here to see, but everything worked out by his plans. By 20, I'd be champ of the world. When did you turn professional? March 6, 1985. So you were 18? Yes. Is there a difference between professional and amateur boxing? Oh, man, night and day. Like, say, uh, me and you're fighting pro, boom. If I knock you down, you get up a fight. He still lost the round. You have to almost kill me to get the round, make an even round, right? And if I knock you down an amateur, you get up and go pop, pop, your head. That's just count for one punch. More points. Yeah, one, one punch. One, one, one point knocking a guy down. And I get up and I go pop, pop. Now I'm ahead. And there's 12 rounds in professional boxing. Yeah, there used to be 15, but there's only three in the pro and amateur. Yeah. But listen, there's some amateur fighters that could beat the best fighter in the world in three rounds, though. Three rounds, they could beat anybody, pro or amateur. There's some guys out there that's good like that. What, what, was your, what was your diet like when you were a teenager? I ate everything when Cuss was alive. Cuss didn't believe in no diets and stuff. He believed in just eating everything you want and just work out harder. And if you eat too much, the more you eat, the more you work out. That's what his belief was. Miss Camille made you really nice oh, meals. She made nothing, she, the most calories in the world. <laughs> Trust me, her, her pie must have had 400 calories, 4,000 calories. And lots of pasta. Oh, oh I, love, I miss that place. I miss it. That's, that's the only time. Listen, my right hand to God, the best time of my life is when I was growing up upstate with Cuss from like 
14th, 19th, that was the best time of my life. Almost perfect, it was almost perfect. And Mr. Cuss was still around to see your first professional fight? Oh, oh yeah, he saw quite a few, about 12 of them. Wow. And that first professional fight you had in 1985, uh, were you nervous? Scared to death. You know, my first amateur fight, let me express this, my first amateur fight, I didn't tell you this, it was, a, it was, a, it was in a Bronx, it was under the train station. And that train station number two, three, it takes me straight to Brownsville, Brooklyn. I was so afraid, I was thinking about catching that flight. That I had that train to go home. I was so scared the first time I was gonna leave. But I overcame and knocked the guy out in the third round. And I, little by little, I started getting more and more confident. And more and more confident, just like you in your life. You're 19 now, you'll be more and more confident. You're gonna see these books that you read and say, that's garbage, I can't believe these people bought that book. You just gotta keep just involving and involving. You just don't get around no toxic people. Because once you start uh, ascending, all the people that even cared about you and you cared about, you start going here, they're going here. And you can't come down. You can't let them bring you down from where you're going. You know, you can still love them, but you're going somewhere they're not going. So sometimes it's dangerous to come down, lower yourself, because you got places to go. You got things to do, you're only 19 years old. A lot of things are gonna be some world leaders, some presidents. You got a lot. You got a lot of. Um, you got a lot of stuff to deal with, young man. I can see if I'm talking with you, there'll be some hard time that's gonna make you tough. Remember, I told you that times you think you never get through. Maybe in bad, scared to face, but it'll make you more than what you ever dreamed to be. Remember that. Don't run away from fear. Fear, you know, the devil wants you to run from fear. That's when he's winning. Face fear. You never lose when you face it. Trust me, you never lose when you face fear. When you can stop being afraid of fear, that was going to pick on somebody else. Thank you for saying that. Hey, so when we talk about when you first turned pro and you started getting on a, you started getting on a winning streak. When you were coming into the ring, you didn't wear robes and fancy things like that, and why not? I just wanted to, I just wanted that to be my style. I used to like the way Jack Dempsey came, he had robes, I used to like, when he was poor, when he first started, I used to read about him, he had nothing. You know, he was one of those white guys that just had, the, you know, um, he's down with the Hatfields and McCoys, he's related to them, so you know that poor white guy in the Colorados, and um, he had to make people, he's, he's, well, I forgot what they called those people again. What they called those people back then, like they used to ride the rail to the hobo. Jack Dempsey was a hobo fighter. Real poor, hobo fighter, go to camps and stuff and gamble and fight for their food and money. And he's one of those guys really at the bottom, the lowest of the lows. And that's why he was my hero too, because I was the lowest of the lows. You know, and um, he was afraid, I was afraid. He considered himself a chicken, I considered myself a chicken. And I'm saying to myself, how can this guy do this all this damage and he has a low self-esteem, you know? I said, how did this work? And I figured um, with low self-esteem collides with the ego, wow, be careful. Yeah, just be careful. You talk about confidence, right? Yeah. yeah. What's that thing you say, confidence? Breeds. Confidence breeds success. Success breeds confidence. Confidence applied properly will supersede the genius. Supersede genius. Yeah. So when you got in that ring with another boxer, what, what were you focusing on? What did you think about? Just making a miss the punches and counter back. You know, just making a miss and counter. Making a miss. How much were you thinking about putting on a show for the audience? Well, I am the show. I mean, the show, show's gonna happen regardless. If the guy comes to fight or not, the show's gonna happen. The show is me getting in the ring. You have to look at fighting like it's a show. It's a show business. Show business. Me coming in with the socks and the no well, that's a show too. The show, sometimes when people say show business, they think of laughing. Sometimes show business become um, malevolent show business, you know? It could be dark show business, but it's show business. People are coming to see it. 
And you do show business now. I mean, you had, you've been in a couple, several movies, and you had, I mean, you had your own Broadway show. It was called Undisputed Truth, mm -hmm. a one-man show. Was it, were there similarities between boxing and acting? Yeah. Relaxation, calmness, a lot of, um, a lot of lies involved with it. Lies? Yeah. Tricking people. And we, we talked about how you went on a streak of winning fight after fight. And I know this must be really sad for you to think about. Uh, but when Mr. Cuss passed away, when he died, how, how did that affect you? <sighs> I just know his happiness would be me being champion. That's all he wanted. He didn't care that this had nothing to do with him dying. This is that this is what we had to do to accomplish our goals. Regardless of whatever happened, he died, my mother died, no matter what, we're gonna accomplish our goals. Nothing mattered but to accomplish the goal. Nobody's life, nobody anything mattered but the goal. That's how I've been trained. You have to be objective when it comes to accomplishing your goals. No feelings are involved. So, after that, after Mr. Cuss passed away, you won fight after fight after fight after fight. I think it was about 27 fights until you got to the heavyweight championship of the world against Trevor Burbick. What were you thinking about coming into that fight? I was just looking forward to that moment. Child, well, I changed all my life since I was 14 for this moment. That's what I thought. How did your life change after you accomplished your goal? You were 20 years old. You had done it. You were the heavyweight championship. You were the heavyweight champion of the world. Nothing that cuss not there, though. Don't mean nothing. We done this for him, you know, a little bit for myself as well, but it doesn't mean nothing. I missed out big time. I missed out big time. Me and him talking about, listen, just me and him talking about how we beat these guys. And how, oh, they're so easy. I can't believe these guys with these big names are so easy to beat, cuz. What are you talking about? This guy got a good jab. Me and him used to talk about guys a lot. What do you mean this guy got a good jab? This guy doesn't have a good jab. He said, listen, if that guy was a little bit more experienced, he would have hit you because you had your hand down. Oh, really, cuz? It was only eight seconds, but I couldn't say that to him. <laughs> In eight seconds, he would have figured me out, huh, cuz? Okay. <laughs> Right, cuz you're right. Yeah, I understand. He always, he always, everything wasn't perfect to him. It's not perfect. It was good, but it's not perfect. Good, but not perfect. Are you a perfectionist? <sighs> How do you know it's perfect? Maybe I might supersede perfection. How do I know if I did that? And how, well, how do we, how do we judge perfection? I don't know. So maybe I'm a perfectionist because I don't believe I ever be perfect. You know what I mean? Perfect. Suppose you hit the spot. What makes it above perfect? Where, where in that spot of the target makes it above perfect? It doesn't, huh? They don't have no scale that's beyond perfect. So how do we know the target's perfect? If it's nothing beyond perfect, how do we know it's perfect? So it's just a continuing process. Yeah, over and over and over and over again. You know, Walt Disney, his famous phrase was keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. Keep moving forward is good, but sometimes you gotta stop from people you love. Sometimes you gotta stop from people that means more to you, to you than you mean to yourself. You can't keep walking, because sometimes you leave a lot of people behind. They need your help. You know, you can't just keep walking. You know, people that talk like that, that's because they did with a lot of people that say they could never do nothing, the people that believe in them. But you gotta stop. You can't keep walking. You can't keep walking, you gotta stop. You gotta stop. You gotta show some knowledge, some love to you. Whatever you have, that's great, you have to stop. You always gotta stop, you can't go forward before, unless you stop. You can't, having all that knowledge means nothing if you don't share it. That's the only purpose of knowledge, is to share it. If you have all the knowledge and you didn't share it, who are you? You're an idiot. If you have it all and no one else has anything, you're in the minority now. If you have it all and anybody else has nothing. Coming back, looking back at your boxing career, 
after you won that WBC championship, yes. you went on to, they call it, unify the belts. You won the WBA and the IBF championships. But what does that mean, unifying the belt? I have all the belts. There's no more belts to be won. Over your boxing career, who was your toughest opponent? Besides myself, I thought it was um, Pinklin Thomas. He's my toughest opponent. I never thought him like, before. He would have asked me five years ago, I was, uh, two years ago, I say, but then I watched the um, tape of him. A friend of mine told me to watch this. And I hit him with 17 punches, flat on the face. And um, he went down, but it was 17 punches. 17 punches, flesh, all of them hard as can be. And the last one, he just passed out. But I used to, I used to throw it a couple of days, I was saying, God, that's my toughest fight. He took 17 on the chin. There was a particular fight against Larry Holmes that had a lot of meaning to you. Why was that so special? Well, listen, we went to watch him fight Muhammad Ali, October 2nd, 1980. I'm near a cuss. We watch the fight, everyone knows Ali lost, bad. We come home, 30 minute drive, 30 miles to Catskill. No music, it's a quiet car. We get out the car, we all go to our room, no one says goodnight or nothing, it's all walk, no, it's, a, it's like a funeral. We all go to our room. And then next morning, we come down, work out and everything, we come downstairs and um, your job now is to avenge Muhammad Ali. That is your job, that is your goal right now to avenge Ali. And that was my goal. Came Lee Cuss gave me all that pressure he put on me. This is, you know, it's like the, he never treated me like a kid. I was just 14. His job is to avenge Muhammad Ali. You know, <laughs> it's crazy, that was me at 14 years old. <laughs> I'm 14 years old, man. But I, I took that, I took that to heart. That's my, my, my goal in my career, to avenge him. And you did it in 1988. Yeah. Both guys, yes. What did, what did Muhammad Ali tell you before that fight? <sighs> He said, get them from me. But I wanted to say, I told you that when I was 14 I was going to do it. <laughs> but I didn't say that. But I was, I was a little upset when he said, get them from me. I said, I told you I was going to do it when I was 14. You were at the top of the world at that point, And you went on to win 37 fights. And then in 1990, you lost to Buster Douglas. Why did you lose that fight? Because um, Buster kicked my butt, that's all, I, that's all I could say. The guy prepared for the fight, and he, he fought the fight of his life. But, this is what we talk about character and um, determination. I handled my loss, I came back, I won title two more times. You know, that doesn't mean I'm greater than him, that means I didn't give up. I didn't give up where some agree where he gave up. I wasn't going to do that. And I realized um, when you come and you're not quitting, anything can happen, you know. He had one great night. That was a great night. I'm, I'm not taking anything away from him. I wish I won that night. But that turned out to be a good night for me because um, after that night, I became human. So it was a possibility that I can get beat so now I can make more money. Now it's a possibility that I could be beat, so they're better than a guy. Then could listen. Because the reason why Buster beat me, because I knocked out everybody that Buster lost to and knocked Buster out. That's why. <laughs> 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 That's why he won. I thought I was gonna knock him out. I knocked out the guy that knocked him out. So he should be scared. <laughs> well, I know he had some extra motivation, you know. He had some rough, rough circumstances. And I have a question. I mean, just kind of a, a random question. Did you enjoy boxing? I mean, did you enjoy fighting? You no, know, for a certain amount of my life, you know, and I did it for myself, don't lie, but I just wanted Cuss to be happy. Because when he's happy, me and him get together, we start talking about all the other fights, how great we are, and oh my God, are we gonna, do we have to fight him, Cuss? Do we have to kill this guy, Cuss? Because don't worry, I just want you to break his ribs. Come here, let me show you. He was like that. That's how he talks to me now. Let's break this guy's rib tonight. They just knocked this guy cold and he can go see the punch. That's the way he kind of gave said. He said, I saw that guy fight you. Come here. We're going to break his ribs tonight. And he showed me the moves they want me to use. You've said that after he died, it all just became about money. It wasn't about the thrill of fighting and becoming champion. It was all about money. Listen, young brother, right? There was people that I thought my family threw cuss. We down together going to 
These people were trying to rob me, they didn't give a damn about The only reason I kept them off me because Cuss was still around. Once Cuss died, they came at me like, man, shark smelling blood. They came at me. I realized, wow. Wow. I wish you could see me now. I wish you could see my kids. That's all. That's, that's why I wanted to see my kids. I want to see my kids. I want to see my wife, too. Oh, this guy would have loved my family now. He would love this family right here. Mm. And it's... You wrote that even when he was gone, he was still helping you in a way because he had started an IRA account of putting aside money that earned interest, right, over over the course of years? I used to do some little child stuff and stuff, and I thought it was cute at the time. I didn't understand the significance of it. You know, I still had money, so I didn't understand the significance of it. Hey, another random boxing question for you. People called you Kid Dynamite, Iron Mike. Did you have any nicknames for yourself? Did you call yourself anything? Yeah, I used to, when I was a kid, I used to call myself the Tan Terror. The Tank? Tan. Tan skin. Yeah. Tan Terror. But I guess I and Mike stayed. I didn't, I didn't think that was a good one. I didn't like the Tan Terror. And you went through some rough times in the 1990s. You were convicted for rape, and you went to jail, and you were in prison for three years. Yeah. So how did that time in jail affect you? I don't know, maybe I had some hang-ups when I would go there with that kind of crime on my jacket and it was just, um, no one judged me. And some people, you know, they didn't judge me, but it, it, I was an enigma there. They was interested in talking to me. Sure. They, um, they were very protective of me, and highly protective of me. You know, sometimes you go to prison, you're in a gang, you don't even know it, you know? You're in a gang, you have no idea you're in this gang. It's just they just they they're there for you whenever you need them. Whenever they need them to go here, need them to do this, need them to go to the cafeteria. It's just um you're just a member of a family. It happens. I don't, you know. I'm no gang based guy, gang bamming, but when you're there you're a member of a family there. It's just how it goes. And you made some of the prisoners really happy. Yes, um this is what I did. I used to always have people send me pictures, you know, famous people. I would get interviews when I'm in my visiting room, they take pictures. So I would give them pictures, you know, my aunt or Whitney Houston after the visits or something, Bobby Brown. And um Yeah, that's what they like. They like that I gave them pictures of the celebrities, also I let celebrities talk to them but in the visiting room. And you said your time in jail worked out to your good. Listen, I can't, I can't, I didn't have a bad experience in prison. I, I, I'm trying to look, I'm trying to make a bad story up <laughs> so I just can't, no, I never bad. It was like being at um, a boarding school for three years. It was, wasn't, um, it wasn't something I thought a guy that would be punished for would go to a place like that, you know? You know there were guys in there that did really bad things, you just, but the way they conduct themselves, you would think that these guys, these, these guys have been in jail all their lives. They're the gentlemen. I expect them to be savage psychos with tattoos all over their face. They got, um, they got so many um, diplomas and so many degrees from so many colleges, they're just never going to be able to go there because they're going to be locked up forever. But it's just, um, there's nothing crazy or stupid about prison or the prisoners, you know. I learned a great... Um, I learned a great deal of respect for them. I, I learned a great deal of respect how these guys can do so much in there, but come out here and it's impossible for them to exist. I just don't understand how, I, I just, I, that, that's the only thing that boggles my mind, that they can live a life in there, but not on the outside. And so you got out around 1995? 95 I got out. After serving three years, and then you went back to boxing and you regained your heavyweight titleship in 96 against yes. Frank Bruno. So what did regaining that belt, what did that, how did that affect you? It's ego, it was all about ego back then. It wasn't about no love and yeah. nothing. Ego, I came out of prison and your guys couldn't stop me from taking the title. It's all about ego, it wasn't about, about no, it was about, about revenge, I was bitter. I was bitter, I was bitter. And I played the role too, the bad guy, the anti-hero and stuff. But um, 
time thing to the reality. We gotta pay bills, we gotta take care of children, we got responsibilities now. And so that became a new um, ideal of mine, being a parent, which I was just, oh, I was so, I was horrible as a parent. I was just really, I don't know, self-consuming. You know, when I was younger. Now in my 30s too, it's self-consuming. But it's so difficult to go from teenager being so um, herded, and then you all of a sudden, you're, next thing you know, you're 40. You know, your lifestyle has to change. Even though you don't want it to change, it just has to change from a different perspective that I'm living now at that particular point in my life. And then it helped that I, had, um, I happened to marry my girlfriend at the time, that's my wife. and. Um, once I married her, you know, we still had trouble, problems with drugs. I was um, still using alcohol and cocaine at the time. And it just, um, it's something that's worked out, you know. I, I can't explain it. It's one of those things, those mystic things that, um, I don't know. Um, me and my wife just always loved each other. Every time we, every time we, had, we were together, she could have been somewhere. I could have been, every time we were together, we always had a good time together. And um, I... Me and my wife, I, I, my wife got pregnant when she had to go to prison. She had to go to prison. She had, to, um, they had some kind of fraud case and she got convicted, her and her mother and her father. And um, she was in prison with the kid. And I was outside living a destructive life. I never dreamed in a million years that she would come back. I would see my baby and say, I want to marry you because I want my baby to have a better life than I had. And um, that's what we call my, my baby Milan the glitter glue. She sticks, she makes us stick together. I don't know why, but why would I want to be with a woman if I didn't have any children with her? And, so, and, it's, and it happened in that particular way. Hey, I'm with this woman, I enjoy being with this woman. Now this baby comes in. And, and, I'm, on, and I'm in rehab and this little baby's born. And I gotta say, hey, I gotta, get, I gotta do something really quick. So why did, why did you end up retiring from boxing? Because I was broken, miserable, and unhappy, that's why. Joe Rogan says that out of any of the fighters in history, in their prime, you were the best ever. Hands down, you could have beaten anybody when you were in your prime. Looking back on your career, is there anything else you wish you had done, you wish you had accomplished? I'm sure there is. I just don't know right this moment. I'm sure there is. You've met a lot of famous people. Did you ever meet someone and you were thinking, whoa, this is, or whoa, I'm meeting. It could be from a gang bang rapper to um, Nelson Mandela. You know what I mean? It's both the same effect. You know, I can't say, well, this is the man. They both gave me that feeling that I'm in the presence of something special. Yeah. Two different people, one the street kid, one the, uh, you know, um, a king. You had pet tigers. Yeah. How did you get tigers? Okay. I'm in prison. I'm talking to my my car dealer. I'm in prison with a car dealer. I'm trying to get the Ferrari F50. I'm trying to get these cars. Well, I'm in prison. I'm doing these deals with <laughs> So my friend is mad at another friend of mine, right, that we do car business together. And he said, if he doesn't pay me my money, I'm gonna take his car and I'm gonna trade him in for some pets. I said, pets, what kind of pets? He said, you know, like ostrich, horses, ponies. I said, what? You can get horses and ponies and trade in cars? He said, definitely. The car costs 500,000, of course I'll give you a horse. And so I said, and this, so he, my friend said this Tony, he said, man, imagine how you look in your Ferrari F50, you got a lion, a tiger in your driving seat. I said, yeah, I want some tigers. So, my wife, who's not my wife, comes to my house to visit me with her family and everything. And then, I come home and there's three tigers, right, the little cubs right there, just delivered to my house. And so um, my wife was there. We had for 13 years, the cats. Because they get old, the hips, the heavy, the hips start going out and the eyes start getting bad. Yeah, but I had my cat for 14 years. Now you said if you didn't show those animals respect, you're finished. Oh, oh yeah, you have to listen. I, had, you know, it was my ego. I had no idea how dangerous I put my life in the hands of these cats. Whew. Because listen, I had to change. She sat down. I couldn't move her. She just sat down. She got tired of walking. I couldn't. I couldn't do nothing. I couldn't move her. Couldn't push her. Yeah, I couldn't do nothing. It's couldn't do nothing. 
I'm nothing. I'm nothing compared to those cats. They kill me in three seconds. Nothing. And they, the cats would like sleep next to you, right, and snuggle. They get nervous every now and then. Cause listen, cats, they 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 daydream like us. They're talking in sleep and they freak out. They're fighting in their dreams and stuff. They just some. Um, they're different than dogs and leopards. Dogs and cheetahs. They're they're more more family than cats. Lions and cheetahs, they're more dogs than cat family. You know, they take orders. Get this, get that, they get orders. Tigers don't take orders. He just know, don't come around me and my guy. Don't, can't have no love, the kids can't come, the wife can't come around, they don't come around. They only, they only deal with one person. One person and that's it. There ain't no family playing with no tiger. Hey, baby, how you doing? And he's not shot up but with all, you know, they shoot the cats up with, um, Morphine or something that slows them down. But um, if they're functional in life, yeah, you can't do that stuff. You have to love them, play with them, then let them go. Too much time, they can't handle too much tension span. They can't handle too much stuff at one time. So your wife, Miss Lakia, you call her your best friend. Yeah, she turned out to be that. What is her, fr what is her friendship meant to you? I, I'm just very grateful to have her in my life, you know. I never thought in a million years me and her be going on this journey. Never in a million years. Um, and not because she's a bad person, or maybe because I'm a bad person, <laughs> but just in a million years, I never thought that we'd be going on this journey together. Never in a million years. You say your kids try to keep your ego down. What do you mean by that? Because they're poor brats, and I let them get away with calling me illiterate and stuff like that. <laughs> Uh, it's crazy. Like I might say something to my daughter. Why don't you um, learn some respect and dignity? She said, Daddy, spell respect and dignity, right? So hit me on that. And then my son goes this way. Say that again, Dad, please. Look at this one. Ma, Dad's illiterate. You heard the way he said it? That's illiterate. I said, I'm not illiterate. Are you crazy? <laughs> and I, so I had to tell my daughter, so I said, listen, the reason why I sent you to this fancy school for nobody could tease you like you teased me, okay? <laughs> oh, my kids love to bust my chops. Are you a grandpa yet? I wish. I wish. Because my kids always listen, I'm in a picture. I'm telling my kids I'm cool. So they see this picture. I guess they had all the celebrities, Maddie Johnson, Prince, Mike, all of us together. And I'm the only one wearing a tuxedo. And we're not in the movie. It's just put a, put a bunch of celebrities together. We're not in the same place. And they said, I said, well, I got a tuxedo. She said, no, Dad, Maggie Johnson got the beautiful coat. Look at Prince. You look like a butler. You're the butler, Dad. Look, <laughs> it didn't look like a butler. But with the tuxedo, I wearing a tuxedo. No, you're wearing a butler's outfit. So, yeah, that's how my kids try to keep me in check. Madonna's bigger than me. Um, who else is bigger than me? Um, Janet, Eddie Murphy. Who else? Prince, Madonna. Yeah, they, they say, that's they're bigger than you, Dad. You're not bigger than Mag. Look at Magic Coat. Your coat's not bad. Look at you, your butler. Oh, they bust my chops like it. Do you do a lot of reading? Do you read a lot? Mm-hmm. Um, I read more of their books now. They got, they read what I used to read and put the Anna Karana and all that stuff. I don't know how they would, they, I don't know why my daughter wants to read that stuff. I told her, I said, listen, all this stuff, Drives you nuts. If you're really in tune with the person, the character of the book, the writer, you're being, you're being insane. Most people that wrote these books are insane. You know? Tolstoy is a kind of creepy. Uh, Nietzsche is out there. Listen, a bunch of those guys are out there. You know, Anne Rand is out there. You familiar with these people? Anne Rand? Yeah. I've heard the name. Oh, wow. That's not, that's not the point, Mr. Tyson, the point is, it's not who's gonna let me, the point is, is who's gonna stop me. That's Anne Rand. She's pretty interesting. One of the great philosophers, she's a great philosopher, yes, it's far, it's really far. She's ahead of the time. Why is it important to exercise, to stay in shape? You must do a lot of exercising. When I'm not, um, when I'm not crippled from exercising earlier, I don't know, it's just, um, it becomes your masculinity. You look at yourself, look at some of your friends and your peers and say, wow, do I look like that? I tell my wife all the time, do I look like, be honest, just be honest, I'm your husband. Do I look like that? You know, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm strong with dieting. 
watching myself because my appearance is my job now. How I look, it depends on if I get the job or not. You do a lot of acting now? Yeah. I've been, um, I've been just traveling a lot. We're going to do some more acting, so I'm just doing too much right now. If you, yeah, can you tell us about the Mike Tyson Cares Foundation? Listen, we go from all over. We help kids with um, literacy testing. We help parents that are having um, domestic spout uh, where they can't go home because of the parents are going to fight each other. So we have arrangements where we put these people in places where they can be taken care of, where they can be fed, where they can have the proper um, essentials for school and work and everything. It's just, um, it's just a... Uh, well, amalgamation of just positive stuff, man. Hey, so these are some life questions for you. Cool. Some, some big thoughts. Your most famous quote, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth, face? Face, mouth. Where did that quote come from? My mentor. Mr. Cuss? Because everybody was saying, I got the plan to beat Mike Tyson. I got the plan to beat Mike Tyson. Yeah, they all got a plan that they get punched in the mouth. He was right. Yeah, I say punch in the face because punch in the mouth is so dated. It's like in the 30s and 20s they said that stuff. You say when I know I'm no when I know I'm nobody, I can never be offended. Yeah. What do you mean by that? When I'm not in my head and my ego. I'm Mike Tyson. How can you say this to me? You know what I do to you? All that kind of crap. How do you handle suffering, adversity? Just to know. Um, not to feel special that it's only me. Sometimes I can feel special that God only wants me to go through this stuff. So I know it's not only me. And it made me feel, you know, to know that. To know that you don't, you're not the only one that had to go through this, but you go, what I'm going through. To know that keeps you alive. To know that you're not special to be the only one that has to go through this adversity keeps you alive. Well, he did. I know I can do it. She can go through it. I know I can go through it. Shit. She went to the psych ward and she, she still came out and be successful. I can go to psych ward too and still come out and change my life. That doesn't have to define us. You know, our mistakes don't define us. Our high points don't define us. Life defines us. And um, the best, as long as you have happy moments, take as many of them as you can because life is just a flick of the eye. It's over before we know it. You're 19, that's so awesome. Hey, so awesome. You say greatness doesn't make you a kind person. Why is it important to be kind? Because listen, in life I met so many great people. Can you imagine how many great people I met? I can imagine. And all those great people I met weren't good people. The most of them, the majority of them are not good people. So I decided to work more on being a good person than being a great person. Other than other than Mr. Cuss, your dad, how, who else did you fear? Who else were you, did you fear? Like have a, right? Is that the right word to you? him out of respect. Yeah. And I may be afraid of other people too, but I'm not intimidated of them. You know, that's a big difference, being afraid and being intimidated. What makes you respect somebody? Hey, um, how they handle the adversities. And I don't have to like them to respect them. What's the secret to doing things you don't want to do or you don't like to do? What's the secret to discipline? Discipline, there's a couple of definitions. Discipline is doing what you hate to do, but do it like you love it. And it also could be, discipline could be taking your illusions and turning them into a reality. Now that's discipline. Imagine, imagine you, you, you have dream of your something, you dream of yourself something bigger than what you can ever imagine and you become it. Well, it's you. Yeah, it is me. It is me. Where, how, do, how does God know that I'm in this filthy place, Brownsville, where no everything goes, there's no rules, and I come from there to me cuss and then come here? How does that work? That's, that's, that has to be a dream. There's no way I could be from Brownsville, Brooklyn, the lowest level of the lowest of poor people, and now I'm here, and everybody thinks I'm somebody. That you don't have to have no um, remorse. What do they call that stuff? Survivors. Um, 
what's that some survivor that you you, um, you feel bad that you survived everybody that didn't make it mm-hmm. survived this guilt you know mm-hmm. can you imagine how that happens to people in the hood how did i make it these guys smarter bigger stronger than me and these guys are begging for money in the street these guys are my heroes or they're gone yeah and it's just um it's that divine intervention stuff that's the only way i can say hey a lot of people think it's that they can't change or that it's really hard to change what advice would you give them or would you give us about how to change in order to be able to change anything you have to change yourself you know you have to look in the mirror and say what do i want to do to make me a better person or what is it that i can do that could define myself as being a better person than i am now you know who can i help who can i worship Who can I do something to or with that would make me feel like a better person and help me reach my highest potential? You have to find that first. What is it that I can do to help me help people? You know, that's all I think about. How can we help somebody? You know? How can we stop somebody from being me and going all the way, then then stopping and observing and seeing other places that can give you a better hope in life? I didn't care about nothing. I was going to go back out and start stealing and robbing again until Custom Model gave me hope for a better life. It gave me hope. It never said nothing negative about me. Enough. It always said positive. Anybody said some negative stuff, Custom might want to fight him, hit him or something. Nobody could offend me. It was like I was his child. Nobody could talk about me. Nothing better be positive. How important is it to choose the right friends? Your future depends on the friends you're with. They would dictate your future. Your friends would dictate your future, where you're going to go in life. What's your definition of a true friend? It's give it to you straight. That's the friend. Friends are like, hey, Mike, that was beautiful. You look great, baby. Yeah, baby, that was beautiful. Oh, baby, that baby, she likes you, baby. Get a number. No, that's not your friend. Your friend just looks at you when you're a human being and you sometimes... Did you ever read um, the Epic of Gilgamesh? You ever heard of that book? No, but I'm familiar with it. You're familiar with it? Yeah, never read it. I tell you what, this Gilgamesh cat, cat, right? He's um half human and half god. I guess the mother of the god of the father, but he's, but he dies. So he's half a god. So he he got his mother's side with him. He's not immortal. Yeah. So um, this is what kind of guy he was. He was the king of his country, and um, he fought with this other guy named Winky Dinky. Winky Dinky was. He, he was just a little bit superb, more than Winky Dink, but Winky Dink gave him the toughest fights. He respected him. That became his best friend. And then Winky Dink found out that this is the kind of king. He had to sleep with every woman before she gets married. And Winky Dink said, you pig, you do that stuff? What kind of man are you? Disgust? Oh, I'm getting sick. And that, that made him, it, it killed him to make this guy who he looked up to and respected, detested him. And so he said, how can you do that? And the guy showed him morals. That you don't do that to people. You be kind to people. Because you're so powerful, you can be kind to people and help people. And then some, some monster killed his friend. And he was afraid. He, he revenged his friend, killed him. But he was afraid of death ever since that. Death was his biggest fear. And then as time went on, and he, he, he got in touch with himself and God, what he believed to be God, and he, and he, and he handled dying. But that was the first book ever written, it's about 6,000, 7,000. The first book was a man afraid to die. Which the we all, of Gilgamesh? Yeah, which we all are. We don't give, we know we're going, we believe we're going to the place, but, even, but before we get on that bus, we're nervous as hell. You know we're all afraid of death. That's the first book written, being afraid of death, huh? Conquering your fears of death, I believe. Hey. Uh, when you look back on your life, other than marrying Mrs. Tyson, what was the best decision you've made? Hey, it has to be believing in Bobby Stewart and um, Custom Mono. Because without them, it's not this. This is not happening. Me and you are not happening. You know, that's the best thing that ever happened to me. Trust, trusting them? That too. Yes, listening to. That's why. That's why I began taking advantage because I trust to a fault by being with him. I said, this is how it is. And other people, it wasn't that way with other people. Like, listen, man, I'm 14 years old. If this man told me to kill somebody, I would do it without a hesitation. Without hesitation, just because he loved me. It's not, just because he loved me, I would kill somebody. If he said do, I would do it without a hesitation. 
no sense. It wouldn't even feel like it's against the law to me. Yes, that's the way it is. That's how I love him. I'm sorry he still isn't around. Uh, listen, if he was around, he'd be screaming at me. You piece of your fighters. You can't beat my fight. I, we gonna, we gonna put all your fighters in here one time. We're going to beat you tonight. All four of you are going to get beat to oh, This guy's so nuts. Oh, this guy's I love that picture. There's a picture of you giving him a hug. That's why I love the, I love the hug because he doesn't like it. What else do you hope to accomplish in your life? Hey, I just, um, I just want to enjoy my time passing through, you know? I'm not trying to, um, well, yeah, I am trying to conquer the world. I just, I just want to enjoy passing through. Because that's all we do, we just passing through. Being some, would be some memory. If I'm lucky, I'd be a picture on the wall somewhere, right? We just passing through. Hmm. Is there anything you'd like people to know about you that they don't? Just passing through. That's all, that's all we all do is passing through. We all have our expiration date. So, Mr. Mike, what's your favorite meal? I don't know. Um, the rice and beans, probably. Favorite movie? It depends. I like... I like um, I like the butler, I like Jer I like um, Errol Flynn, Gentleman Jim. Yeah, those two, yeah. You have a favorite book? Oh, I have a lot of books. I want to say um, Intellectual Intelligence, but I'm just going to stick with The Prince, Machiavelli. Favorite animal? Pigeon. Do you have a favorite person from history? Alexander the Great. So thanks everyone for watching this video with Mr. Mike Tyson. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you haven't already, please subscribe below to the History Bites YouTube channel. And there are links there where you can learn more about Mike Tyson and his amazing career and accomplishments and all the things he's doing now. And until next time, go learn your history.